I appreciate that. I appreciate some young people. Uh, when you put them under the spot, they react and they respond and they, they produce. Uh, so many people today, you go up and ask them to do something, they look at you like a, I mean, just like a train's getting ready to hit them on a railroad track, and they just sit there like a deer in the headlights, and they wouldn't do something like that in a million years, and yet uh, our young people, we got some great young people, I'm telling you, man, I love them all, I mean, I've watched them grow, I had people say, well, you put a lot of effort in young people, well, guess what, we're going away and they're going to go on, and they, you better put some effort in something. Uh, if, if, you, if you can stay for another hundred years, then hey, get up here and you do that, but I'm telling you, it's a blessing, man. Uh, I'm not preaching tonight, uh, Brother Travis, and uh, I got three guys going to preach. Travis is going to be first. Joe sang that first song, Love Found a Way. And uh, I was listening to him play up here, and uh, I remember, like I, I've said this before, unless you've been out by yourself somewhere where you have absolutely nothing, you don't really know how to appreciate what God's given you. You don't have no idea. Uh, we go through so many church after church after church, we can just pick any church in the world. You don't really realize what he gave you, what he gave us. Uh, being out on a ship in the middle of the ocean, you don't have that. And I, we didn't have nothing like this, and we didn't have a church come to, and we didn't have songbooks that we could sit there and sing. And all you have a Bible, and I had a Bible, and I could read my Bible. But I'll tell you what, when Chaplain Downing called me down on the Ponce to his office one day, me and Claude Harris, and he said, hey, Brother Elliot. I said, yes, sir. He's an officer. I'm enlisted. He said, will you start a church on this ship? I'm like, what? A Protestant chaplain coming to me, he goes, and it has to be a Baptist church. It can't just be the only ship in the United States Navy that ever had a Baptist church on it was the USS Ponce LPD-15, and that church, we had a Baptist church on there, and it went on for 20-something years after I left. That was God. Now, brethren, that's God. And I'm sitting here going, Lord, I want, I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. Well, just to let you know, Adam, Adam's been taking piano lessons, which I told him to because we need to replace Amy. Uh, I told you, sis, I told you it's over, man. Uh, you see what happened right there? Just moments notice it's over. She comes up, she goes, I got a thorn in my flesh, and you better be glad I got the band aid and I can still play the piano. I said, you can be replaced like anybody else in a heartbeat. We just did it. We just did it. Uh, I mean, at a moment, at a drop of the hat, boy, that's a blessing. Most people don't get that. You couldn't do that in most churches if you wanted to. I could have pulled a couple piano players up here probably taking place right there and done that. Not necessarily to that degree, but I mean, hey, that's good. Anyways, that song he sung, love, wonderful love that rescued me, sunk deep in sin. I, since I'm not preaching, I'm going to preach. Uh, guilty and vile as I could be, no hope within. Were you ever that way? I was. I was just like that. You know why nobody likes these songs anymore? Because they tell the truth. And when you stop and look at these songs as they were written, these people knew exactly what this stuff today is all this emotional trash. This is real stuff here, man. This is like reading your Bible. Uh, no hope within. When every ray of light had fled, I mean, when there was nothing left, oh, glorious, uh, uh, had light had fled, oh, glorious day, raising my soul from out of dead, love found a way. He knew exactly what it was going to take to get James Michael Elliott saved. He knew that, and he found a way to do it. That second verse is, love brought my Savior here to die on Calvary. He didn't do that for any other reason than he loved you. We don't know what love is. This is love right here. On Calvary, uh, uh, died, uh, brought a Savior on Calvary for, for such a uh, sinful wretch as I. How can it be? Love bridged the gulf betwixt me and heaven, taught me to pray. I am redeemed, set free, forgiven, love found a way. That last verse is the one I liked. Love opened wide, uh, oh, love opened wide the gates of light to heaven's domain. Where in eternity, eternal power, might Jesus, uh, my Jesus shall re uh, reign. Love lifted me from depths of woe to, endless, to an endless day. There was no hope in earth below. Love found a way. The Lord found a way to do that thing. Brother, I'm telling you what. You all, that stuff like that make you shout. Because when you had no hope within, the Lord already had a way. We love him because he first loved us. And, and sometimes you just don't understand that. I tell you what, being out there with absolutely nothing and thinking, and I mean, night after night, after day after day, just thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, I'm like, Lord, I'm not doing anything for you. I'll never be able to do anything for you. I'm stuck out on a ship in the middle of the ocean. Uh, and the Lord says, yeah, you can't because you're, me and you're developing a relationship that's going to go with you for the rest of your life. You don't know that. You just think you're all by yourself and alone and there's nobody else around and, and the whole world is going by and you're out there by yourself. You don't know that. 
He says, I can do whatever I want to do. I can bring bees and run people off. I can do whatever I want to do. I can kill 185,000 or 145,000 like that. I can, bring, I can bring the chariots of angels above the mulberry trees anytime I want. He goes, Mike, I can do, I can raise you from the pit to the palace in a moment. That's not, it's nothing for me. You know what the hardest thing is? To find me and to love me. That's all it is. We're going into revival to starting tomorrow night like we really need it. Uh, I don't know what we really call this. We call it a revival. It's really not a revival. I think you're already revived. I think it's an upheaval. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to get you a little bit higher than what you are right now. A little bit closer than you are right now. I told these three guys, I said, all three of you preach a revival message. We'll see if they obeyed or not. Uh, Jerry, oh, where's Jerry? Oh, I got, I got, is my bell down there? Somebody done stole my bell. That's all right. Oh, is it? Good. Hear this? When that goes, you are done. There ain't no minute. But fortunately, the clock's behind me. You got the mic? All right, Brother Travis is going to start us off. Yeah, if you all would, go to Luke chapter 15. That's where we're going to be tonight. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's a blessing to actually be able to be in a church that still preaches the Word of God and uh, in reality that still actually has revivals too. I remember when we first came to church uh, here, you know, me and Michaela, it's been about four years since we've, you know, come to the church. And uh, when we first came here, it was for a meeting that uh, Dr. Peacock had for one of the revival meetings that we came to. And I took my last vacation day to come here. And uh, the guy that was there at work, uh, one of the guys at work was sitting there and he's like, you mean to tell me a church still has revival meetings? He's like, man, I haven't heard about that in like years. And so the fact that we still have a church that you know has revival meetings is a blessing. Um, but yeah, like I said, we're going to be in Luke chapter number 15. If you would, go to verse number 11. That's where we'll start. Bible says, and he said a, cer uh, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he, div uh, he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and uh, he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain, uh, he would have, fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he had come to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough uh, and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Uh, Brother Tom Lynch, would you pray for me, please? So the first thing that I want to hit on is the fact that, you know, verse about verse 12 through 16 is that the world always has something to distract you from God and what's rightfully his. You know, the substances that you've been given were given to you from God, and uh, a lot of people decide they want to run off and do what they want with what God's given them. And, uh, you know, you think about a lot of these people who are out here in the world and they have no hope, they have no vision of anything that they want to do. And, uh, you know, they have these things that have been given to them. You know, it says that all things were created by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And so everything that was given to us was given to us by God. Whether you're lost or saved, it's still God's. And so, uh, you know, these people run around out here and they have no vision, they have no hope, and they run out and they do what they want. And, uh, you know, but that's the lost people. Uh, but the sad reality is a lot of Christian folk do that too. They take what God's given them, and they go out, and they do what they want with it, and they don't ever give in return anything that God has given them. Um, 
verse number, uh, verse number 14 says, And uh, when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Uh, just so you know, once you see, well, you'll, you'll soon realize that God's timing is always right, and uh, you know, you'll be in want. It just seems like right there in that passage, you know, he says, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. God waited right until that exact moment when he had spent everything he had that was given to him, that that famine hit. Um, you know, we were talking to uh, our neighbor the other day, and he came out, and uh, we were talking about some of the, you know, uh, some of the stuff that he's been going through, and uh, the guy said that he's been in jail like 17 times. And, uh, you know, I told him, I'm like, oh, that's funny, man. I go and preach people to jail. And so that just gave me an opportunity to kind of start talking to him. Uh, and his exact words, Michaela's my witness, his exact words was, he said that these people, he goes, they don't need preaching. What they need is somebody to talk to. Uh, you know, and the fact the guy's been there 17 times, he's had people to talk to, apparently they haven't been doing a very good job. You know, the thing is, is we need preaching. It doesn't matter whether or not you're a convict. It doesn't matter whether or not you're a Christian. You know, it's in church, daily, a Bible believer. You need preaching. And, uh, you know, verse 16 says, And he would have fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. You know, if you withdraw yourself from God, you'll start eating up the stuff of this world. You know, and there's a famine in the land, and it's that of the truth. You know, no matter where you go, you look, and people always have an opinion as to what they think is truth. You know, and they'll tell you, oh, well, truth is relative. So what I think might not necessarily be what you think. But in reality, this Bible tells you exactly what the truth is. Amen. And so that's why it's important that we have that preaching. You know, it's, uh, we have the truth here at Anchor Baptist Church. We have the truth here. When me and Michaela were looking for churches. We could not find a place to go, no matter where you looked. I mean, you know, we have, you know, Sister Sarah came here from Cincinnati. We have the Berries came here from Columbus. I mean, there is, like, no Bible-believing churches, and if you find one, they're, like, usually dead, and there's, like, no spirit there at all. Um, but, you know, the truth of God's word makes you alive. John 6, 63 says it is the spirit that quickeneth. You know, quickeneth means to make alive, to revive. You know, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You know, Jesus Christ gave you, uh, gave you a solid truth right there, and he said the words that I speak, you know, they are uh, unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You know, we have the words of God right here uh, in the King James Bible. And it says, uh, you know, it's, uh, he says, you know, the spirit, it, um, it is the spirit that quickeneth, you know, to make alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. So all these people try to feed their flesh, try to get this comfort in life. In reality, you know, you'll go through some stuff and uh, life isn't very comfortable sometimes. You know, and uh, me and Ben were talking the other day and, uh, you know, he asked me, he's like, hey, so if you ever got a shut off for my house, he's like, would you shut my power off? I was like, absolutely, I would. <laughs> I mean, I told him, I'm like, you know, it's my job. I was like, I'd do it. And he's like, you know, brother, he's like, I respect you for that. He's like, for the fact that, you know, he's like, you'd tell, you, you would do that. And I told him, it's like, yeah, well, you know, when you, have, when you have something you have to do, you have a job you have to do, it's like, it doesn't matter how uncomfortable it makes you, right? You still have to do what you're told to do. And sometimes, you know, like growing up, my dad told me, you know, the truth hurts. <laughs> and the truth hurts. Whether or not you're telling somebody the truth or you're admitting the truth about yourself, sometimes it hurts. Um, but you want to know what you're going to get from a revival this week? If you really want it, you're going to get truth from God's word to help you keep going, you know, or to help you get back to the Father's house. You know, it's like Pastor was saying just a second ago, the fact that, you know, we, you know, some people may not need the, you know, to go back necessarily to the Father's house, but we all do need to get closer to him. I mean, we can always get closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the first step to revival, if you notice in verse number 17, he says, and he, uh, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to, uh, and to spare, and I perish with hunger. You know, the first step to revival is to come to yourself. You know, realize that you're the one that left the father, and, you know, the father's still back at the house. You know, I mean, honestly, do you enjoy really being in the pig pen? You know, this world is full of philosophical garbage. I mean, you have people like Joe Rogan who try to tell you if you take mushrooms or some kind of psychedelic drugs, you know, it causes you to get closer to the Lord Jesus Christ and everything like that. It's like, God, you don't even know who Jesus Christ is. Yeah. Why should I listen to anything that you say? Yeah. Or Jordan Peterson or all these other big names out there that people are, you know, leaning towards. And it's because, you know, they have a cult following. And, you know, people look up at them, oh, you're some great philosophical man. It's like, you don't know nothing. <laughs> like, you're not giving me any verses from the Bible. You're telling me, well, this is exactly what I, you know, this is exactly what it is. It's like, no, you're an idiot is what you are. But, you know, you have the stuff, and like I said, you have all this philosophical garbage that they try to feed you. 
And you have some, you know, like back in the 50s or 60s, you had some, you know, country guy named Leroy out in the field, you know, sitting there. It's like, man, I seen some big old UFO, man. I seen it. Look like a big old flying saucer out there, man. You see it with all these lights and stuff. And now you got the government and the media telling you, oh, yeah, well, they exist. You know, and it's kind of like, but you believe it. You believe the news media once they tell you, but you don't believe some country guy who has some more sense than what the news media does. But, you know, it's like it's the same thing, you know, when the preacher tells you about the Bible and Jesus Christ and you think that he's a nut, you know, but he's got the truth. You know, the world, you know, don't let the world deceive you with its dainty meats. It's going to come to you telling you all these sweet things that's going to make you feel good. It's like sometimes, like I said, you're not going to feel good. Um, but the second step that is, you know, actually making a step back and moving back to the Father's house. You know, you'll quickly realize the world is no good and the joy and fellowship that you had with the Lord is greater than anything that the world could give you. You know, we have all these things that get put in our path, you know, and everything like that that can take us away from what true revival really is. You know, you have all this stuff that's feeding your flesh, and you think that it feels good, and then when you're in the pig pen, like this guy was, you know, he realized, he's like, I, he's like, I, I don't want this anymore. He's like, I'm in the dirt, man. I have no hope. I have nothing to look forward to. And, you know, the Bible tells you, it says that uh, the word's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Psalms 119, 105. And the importance of this revival coming up is the fact, like I said, you're going to get a preacher in here, you know, Dr. Peacock, who is one of the greatest Bible preachers that are around, and he's going to tell you the truth from the Word of God, and that's really rare to find. Um, but yeah, the world, you know, the, uh, the Word directs you where you, want it, uh, uh, where you want to go, and it shines the path before you, and the road back to the Father's house will seem brighter and brighter the closer you get back home. Um, verses 20 through 24 uh, the third thing to revival is, to act, is the um, actual reunion with the Lord. So if you would, look at that passage. It says, and he rose and came, uh, uh, came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And the father said to his servant, bring forth the best robe and put, on him, uh, and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. You know, the third thing to revival is actually reunion with the Lord. And the Lord cleans, uh, uh, the Lord cleans you up and feeds you. Then you become revived and you get some meat, you know, put back on your bones. You know, this week is highly important, uh, you know, for us all to be here, you know, to get something from the Lord. The world's getting crazier and crazier and we all need to be close to God. And the closer we get to the end of the church age. You know, the neat thing is, especially being here, you know, with, uh, you know, like I said, with the revival and everything coming up is if you're actually out doing something for the Lord, you'll realize how hungry people really are. Amen. You know, especially when, you, you know, us going to the jails and stuff like that, you would think that we're dealing with some, you know, crazy hardened criminals. But me and Brother Tom were talking about this the other day. It seems like the more we're, in, uh, you know, in the jails and stuff, we're dealing with saved people. You know, people who need, you know, a little bit of hope and a little bit of encouragement to go on. And uh, like I said, regardless of whether or not you're a convict or you're a Christian, you still have something you got to move forward to. And uh, this world can cause a lot of distractions. And um, I remember when was, I think it was the last Tuesday night jail that we went to. I had a guy uh, that was there. We were talking to him, and uh, we had two big groups come out. We didn't even get a chance to go back in the cells and talk to the guys back there. But one of the guys I was talking to was telling me, I was like, you know, basically asking him if he was saved. And he said, yeah, I'm saved. And uh, you know, he had a pretty solid testimony, and the dude was like, yeah, man, I got in trouble for, you know, some stuff that I did, and I told him, I was like, I don't even care what you did, I, I honestly don't care, um, but he was, you know, I was telling him, I'm like, one of the hardest things you're going to realize is that all things work together for good to them that love God, and I quoted him Romans 8, 28, and that's similar with us as Christians, you know, it's hard for us to realize that all things are going to work together for good, regardless of the things we're going through in life. And uh, so that's why, like I said, it's important that we're here for this revival. And, um, you know, I'll kind of wrap it up here so that way we can get somebody else up here and start preaching. But, um, you know, like I said, this week is going to be really important for us to be here um, to hear the word of God. Because we need something that's going to keep us going, something that's going to keep us, you know, uh, you know, basically striving to fight through this life. Because this mental battle that we're going through is going to be hard. And uh, that's one of the hardest things that we have to go through is dealing with that constant battle of, you know, the devil telling you that you're no good, you're, you know, you're never going to make it, you know, oh, would you, if you're saved, would you really be doing this, would you be doing that? And it's like constant battle all the time, and the Lord, this sweet little voice comes in and just tells you, hey, it's all right, it's all right, just keep going on just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer, just keep fighting. You know, and I like how Pastor quotes Pilgrim's Progress all the time, great book, 
you know, and you have the, uh, one of the best parts in that book for me was when he was walking through and he was getting ready to, you know, go through this path and there's these lions and this guy starts coming back. He's like, there's lions in the way, there's lions in the way. He's like, I can't go. And so he just takes off. And Christian was like, no, he's like, I'm, I'm going forward. And, they, you know, you go forward and those lions were chained. They couldn't even get to the road. But that guy was like, nope, there's lions in the way. And he just seen, he seen something and he perceived it as being, you know, bad and evil and it was going to get him and he took off. You know, us as Christians, we have things that might be put in our path that make, uh, might make us realize, man, he's like, no, there's lines in the way. There's lines in the way. I can't do it. And then, you know, you're going to get up to it. And the next thing you know, you're going to realize the Lord has those things on a leash. And it's like, look, I told you to keep going forward. And so, like I said, with this, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. But uh, it's important, like I said, we're here for revival this week. So that way we can get something from God and just, just allow us to keep going forward. So that way we can keep fighting and doing what the Lord would have us to do. So.